Croce is this year's uh, Battistella lecture, and I won't spend too much time uh, about his uh, background except to uh, highlight uh, some of the things I think he's most proud of and some of the things that uh, makes him an outstanding uh, selection uh, to honor Felix and his tradition here. First of all, um, you, you, have to, you have to know this. It, um, Martin works at the Elvis Presley Trauma Center in Memphis. He's extremely proud of being the director of trauma at the Elvis Presley <laughs> Trauma Center. He, 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 I bet he says Elvis Presley Trauma Center a number of times during his talk. He just loves the name and the fact that that's the trauma center that he works in. That tells just a little bit about his personality. Kind of the other side of it, he's a proud graduate of Notre Dame. And so you have to take that with a grain of salt, too, because uh, he bleeds the gold and blue of Notre Dame. And I think you still have season tickets uh, to games? Um, I, I still go up every year. Yeah, it still goes to regular games. So he's a proud Notre Dame graduate as well. His contributions uh, to the field of trauma uh, cover virtually every category that you could imagine and think of. Um, from the clinical aspects to the basic science aspects, from colorectal surgery to uh, pulmonary disease, which is what he's going to talk about us today, but uh, really a, a, a PubMed search of anything in trauma will have Martin's name uh, attached to virtually all the major topics. He's ascended as a result of that through the leadership ranks of our professional societies and will be uh, uh, soon upcoming to be the president of the AAST, our American Association for Surgery Trauma. He's a member of the American Board of Surgery and is a current chair of the Trauma, Burns, and Critical Care Component Board, which means he's in charge of writing the critical care examination uh, that uh, our fellows in circle critical care will be taking as well. He's got a long history of interest in uh, uh, both uh, bronchoscopy and diagnosing hospital-acquired pneumonia in trauma patients, and so that will be the focus of his uh, talk today. But his wealth of information uh, will be shared with others during today and last night uh, and his great experience in the field of trauma care. So Martin, glad to have you here and welcome. Well, thanks very much. I, I appreciate the uh, invitation. It, it, I, if everyone stays awake, and I'll be watching, uh, I'll tell you how the place really came to be named the Elvis Presley Memorial Trauma Center. It, it, really, is, it really is called that. Uh, I, I'll give you just a little teaser, though. The Elvis Presley Memorial Trauma Center remains the only freestanding building in the world named in honor of the king. So there you have it. Uh, I also want to express my uh, uh, extreme gratitude and, and quite humbled uh, to be asked to, to be here at this lectureship. I, I had the uh, uh, fortune of knowing Felix, or meeting Felix. I didn't know him very well, but knew of him. And you know, in our world, you know, you know of people because they've done stuff, right? And he did stuff. And this is primarily for the the the. Uh, residents and the students and the, and the junior faculty, if you look at his, uh, his contributions were uh, uh, in, in a wide areas uh, of, of study of the uh, multiply injured patient, the, those that are in kind of a bluish thing are, are both clinical and basic science related topics uh, that, that he approached. So my advice to you, and, and, and I can give the advice because I happen to have the podium, uh, it, it is to, to try a bunch of different things. You know, you, let your mind go and try a bunch of different things and you'll find something that, that really floats your boat, that, that really incites the passion. And then go ahead and pursue that. But don't throw away all the other things because, you know, each, each day, and he really exemplified this, each day we should try to get just a little bit smarter. And if we get a little bit smarter, then that, who, who benefits the most of that, of course, our patients do. I have uh, no conflicts. Um, it, it, it's always funny when people always put this slide, if I have nothing to disclose, well then sit down, right? <laughs> um, but, but I have no conflicts. Uh, to, so, and this is, uh, a, a, this is not at our trauma center, but this is actually in downtown Memphis, this uh, wonderful rendition of, of the king. 
people may say, why is a surgeon going to get up and talk about pneumonia? Pneumonia is perhaps about the most boring uh, thing that you can come up with. Uh, and why are surgeons even fooling with pneumonia? Why, why do you take care of it? Uh, it? Well, because people die from pneumonia. Now, do they die because of their injury and they just happen to have pneumonia? Or do they die from pneumonia and it's completely unrelated to the injury? Well, first of all, if you look at several series, uh, including one uh, fairly recent um, um, Cochrane uh, series, that you know a lot of people die because of pneumonia, and, and 15 to 20 percent overall mortality from patient, for, for trauma patients who have pneumonia. That's pretty significant. That's you know one in five or one in six people that you see that that, that are trauma patients that they get pneumonia that. that, that they're going to die. So I can't imagine an illness or a disease that is more of a surgical problem, right? Uh, so in order to try to answer the question is really what is the, the, the impact of pneumonia on outcome in trauma patients? We looked at about 50, a little over 15,000 patients. Uh, almost 6,000 of these were ICU admissions, and we broke them down into not hurt very badly, with an injury severity score of less than 25 versus hurt pretty badly with uh, an ISS greater than 25. And the, the, the typical urban uh, demographic uh, trauma ICU admission pattern. And if you look at just those patients who are less severely injured uh, and do logistic regression, if they develop pneumonia, they're four and a half times more likely to die than if they didn't. And this is for people who are not severely injured, ISS less than 25. What about the impact of age? Again, uh, it, young people, less than 40, uh, I, I, that, that ship sailed uh, for me a long time ago. But uh, if you consider 40 being young for trauma, and actually it's a little bit old, sadly, uh, but, but age less than 40, you're 33 times more likely if you develop a pneumonia uh, to die, and even people who don't have bad head injuries, who have minor head injuries or no head injury at all, you're almost seven times more likely to die if you develop a ventilator-associated pneumonia. What about the people who are, are hurt pretty badly? Well, these are the patients who probably die with pneumonia, not necessarily because of pneumonia. So only when you get to the most severely injured patients does injury impact outcome more than pneumonia does. So it, 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 it's really important that we be very aggressive with uh, the management of, of uh, ventilator-associated pneumonia because it's got significant attributable mortality. So hopefully we can dispel that myth that it's, the pneumonia is not really a surgical disease because it really is. Now, I've spent a fair amount of time trying to look at something that's just fascinating. How do you diagnose pneumonia? I was kidding about the fascinating part. It's really, uh, uh, but uh, it, it, one would think that this is really pretty simple. That it should be a clinical diagnosis. You know, you get some sputum in a cup and you culture it, and off you go. Well, the the, the whole diagnosis has really evolved, and and typically uh, we started out with sputum cultures, which is pretty simple. Uh, it's not particularly specific, right? Because you know we, we could culture most of the people here, and you would grow some organisms out of your sputum. Uh, but more importantly, it leads to unnecessary antibiotics. We already heard earlier today from one of the excellent presentations, I might add, and parenthetically, it's nice to see other institutions that have complications uh, similar to our own. Uh, well, not really nice, but uh, uh, at any rate, but it leads to unnecessary antibiotics and development of uh, resistant organisms, right? It costs that one patient. Uh, uh, the, he paid the ultimate price for his resistant acinetobacter. So that's, that's the story with sputum cultures. So then came about invasive techniques, and, and this all came about really at, at the time when uh, HIV became um, uh, more of a uh, national disease, uh, because nobody really knew how to diagnose pneumonia, and a lot of those patients didn't really produce a lot of sputum, so they couldn't really tell. So um, they started doing bronchoscopy with bronchoalveolar lavages in these patients in order to establish a diagnosis. Uh, it's obviously more labor intensive because you need a bronchoscope. Uh, it, but it's sensitive and, and, and pretty specific uh, and can really streamline your antibiotics. But if only there was an easier way to do this, right? And that's where the whole clinical pulmonary infection score came about. 
that's a pretty simple thing. It's a measure of the pulmonary inflammatory response, which in theory would be related to the development of a pneumonia. And also some have suggested it can be used to um, uh, look at antibiotic duration. So we tried to look at this, uh, the impact of the clinical pulmonary infection score uh, in trauma patients because we were, we were intrigued by it. And this is the score. You're assigned points, um, oddly enough, from 0, 1, or 2 uh, to a, a total of 10. And these are all pretty common things that we can easily ascertain at the bedside or by looking at the, at the chest x-ray. And 6 is the score that you need for the diagnosis. And if you look through the literature, it has decent sensitivity. Specificities are sort of all over the chart. And Dr. Singh in the year in 2000, when she described this, said that a CPIS of greater than six virtually excluded acute lung injury, pulmonary edema, atelectasis, or contusion as causes of pulmonary infiltrates in ICU patients. That's a pretty bold statement, right? Not, not quite as bold as I don't trust our own uh, intelligence community, uh, <laughs> but, a, but a pretty bold statement. Oh, did, wait, did I say that out loud, or did I think that? Sorry. Uh, but, but, but again, this is a pretty bold statement. So we thought we, we would look at this and compare this. Since, uh, during, during the time of this particular study, all of our pneumonia diagnoses were established by bronchoscopy and BAL. So we compared those uh, who did and did not have pneumonia. Uh, and again, the, these patients are all uh, uh, very similar. So if you look at those with, with, with a CPIS of greater than 6, in the trauma patients, in the trauma ICU, we found that it had a sensitivity of 60%, a specificity of 40%, positive predictive value of 44%, and a negative predictive value of 62%. That's not really very good. And in fact, if you plot it over time, you're looking at CPIS uh, on the x-axis, and the percent with pneumonia as demonstrated by this line here, uh, th this is really, it's, it's not very good when it comes to trauma patients. So the CPIS is not beneficial at all in the di diagnosis of, of pneumonia in the trauma patients. Why? Because it can't differentiate inflammation from infection, right? Big difference, right? We treat infection with antibiotics. We treat inflammation with support and antibiotics are, are, are not particularly necessary. Well, okay, wise guy, you've talked about, uh, you, you, you've basically slammed all the standard ways that we've diagnosed pneumonia, and you're now promoting some way that's gonna increase healthcare costs, uh, and, and it's not really, not really cost effective, because what's the big deal about just going ahead and treating a patient for seven or 10 days or so with antibiotics? Not very harmful. Well. Think about the, how we diagnose systemic inflammatory response syndrome, right? And it's fever, leukocytosis, uh, tachycardia, and, and uh, tachypnea. Not really any different than how we diagnose sepsis, except there's one major infection, and that's where one major exception, and that's where infection must be present. And the only way that we know that infection is present is if we actually do the culture. Okay, the, the, this is an algorithm uh, that's published by these. Two guys from France, and I, I, I used to know how to pronounce their name, but Pump Brain, and I, I can't remember how to pronounce, so I don't want to butcher their name, but it's, these guys are pretty smart guys, and they've, they've published quite a bit on bronchoscopy and pneumonia. The only downside is they're internists, um, but sorry if there's any internists here. I'm not sorry at all. Uh, but, uh, so if you have a clinical infection, if you go through all this, uh, basically, go through this algorithm, if you have positive cultures, right, so if you do have positive cultures, you adjust the antibiotics, which that's pretty smart, right? That's how we normally do things. But the interesting thing is if you have negative cultures, they continue or adjust antibiotics, which makes absolutely no sense to me, because if your cultures are negative, why do you need to continue antibiotics? This patient has an inflammatory response for whatever reason, so antibiotics are simply not necessary and, in fact, potentially harmful. Well, this was done in a, primarily a medical ICU population, which admittedly is completely different from a trauma ICU population. Uh, but nonetheless, so let's focus a little bit on the trauma patients. And there's a whole bunch of, uh, of problems with interpreting the data from trauma patients. 
they can have an overwhelming inflammatory response. If we check their, if we just check their sputum, their 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 tracheas are colonized about four nanoseconds after they're intubated. Uh, you can't really interpret the chest X-ray very well because they've got contusion or an evolving contusion or they develop ARDS or for all sorts of different reasons. Okay, so. It, th this was actually the original study that we did on, on BALs a long time ago, but uh, we, we took a uh, little over 100 patients, and we obtained cultures in triplicate on these patients. First, we did a routine sputum sample, because at the time, that's how we diagnosed pneumonia. We then, under, then the patient underwent bronchoscopy with protected brushings, and then they underwent bronchoviral lavage. So we had each patient serving as their own control, basically, and they had three sets of cultures. And so the criteria for diagnosis for routine sputum samples, they had to have a, uh, they had to have a pathogen present. For a brush, the diagnostic threshold was 10 to the third, and for BAL, it was 10 to the fifth. How do we come up with 10 to the fifth? Because that's what they use for the immunocompromised patients uh, it, 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 to primarily diagnose pneumocystis at the time, so we chose 10 to the fifth. That has since uh, devolved into 10 to the fourth in, in many centers. Um, I'll show you some data on that uh, later. Uh, but again, all these patients had clinical evidence of pneumonia. They had fever, leukocytosis, purulent sputum, and a newer changing infiltrate on their chest X-ray. So if you look at the incidence of pneumonia based on that particular, um, those definitions, Really, only 75% of patients with routine sputum sample even had pathogens present on their sample. And uh, the brush and BAL were significantly lower when it came to significant colony counts by each particular method. Clinically, you couldn't tell the difference between the two. They all had fever. They all had a leukocytosis. Uh, and they had, I refuse to say bandemia, but I'll say it. Um, it drives me crazy when the residents say that. Uh, but they, they had a, a shift to the left. Uh, so w what about the charges? And th these are charges, a little bit older charges, uh, again, because this study is a, a little old. But the, you know, it costs a lot to do this, right? It costs a lot to do bronchoscopy with BAL. Uh, so the total charges for this, if you do, it's just routine sputum sample for these 107 patients, pretty cheap to, to just get some spit in a cup and, and culture that. Total cost was $150 uh, per patient. If you use the brush, it was almost $700 a patient and a little bit under that uh, for BAL because you didn't have to buy the brush uh, it, itself. The culture techniques were the same or the quantitative cultures. So that's a pretty big different in, difference in price. But then if you look at antibiotic charges, and, and th these are acquisition costs by the pharmacy. This is not like the, the Whenever you read things about hospital finances and whatnot, you have to be able to separate out in your head, is this funny money that we're talking about or is this real money that we're talking about? Now, the funny money is how many CAT scans that you do or how many of something you do because you've already, the hospital already has the CAT scanner. They already pay the techs to be there, right? So they get paid whether they're doing something or not. So that's all kind of the funny money part. But the antibiotic costs, you try buying antibiotics from a company without paying for them? No, it's like you, you can't go to the store and buy a gallon of milk without giving somebody some money. And it's the same thing when it comes to antibiotics. So this is real dollars that the hospital expends. Uh, and these are the, the typical charges for a, a three-day and a 14-day uh, course. So if we assume that, uh, that pa patients are treated with ceftazidime and vancomycin, if we base their therapy on routine sputum diagnosis of pneumonia, for this particular study, uh, it would have cost uh, a little over $300,000. If we use the brush, since only a quarter of those patients had pneumonia, it's down to $176,000. And for BAL, it's down to $130,000. So from that data, we concluded that using quantitative cultures for ventilator-associated pneumonia diagnosis is very cost-effective. And it's real money. Again, all the hospitals already own bronchoscopes. Right? They already pay the person to maintain the bronchoscope, but they've got to cough up money to Pfizer or Lilly or whoever to uh, get the antibiotics. Well, that's all fine and good for people who are not particularly sick, but, but still, these, these patients are, are, are sick. And if we think back to that the French algorithm, then maybe we really need to continue antibiotics for a little bit longer because those patients 
are so ill and they'll, they'll get better. So maybe it's really harmful if we did that. So given that previous study, that led to this prospective trial that we did where we took all patients who were mechanically, all trauma patients who were mechanically ventilated with clinical evidence of pneumonia. Um, th these are all patients in the trauma ICU at the Elvis Presley Memorial Trauma Center. Uh, they had e three of the four, fever, leukocytosis, purulent sputum, or newer changing infiltrate with no other obvious infection. Uh, concomitant antibiotics from our, our, our um, antibiotic steward colleagues like orthopedics and face, um, uh, they, they were acceptable because, uh, you know, somebody with an open fracture, they need to have antibiotics. But all these patients underwent fiber optic bronchoscopy with bronchoveal lavage. And these were the definitions that we used for this study. They had pneumonia if they had 10 of the fifth organisms, period. We, we considered that they had a systemic inflammatory response if, they, if on their BAL they had less than 10 to the fifth organisms. Uh, we considered a false negative BAL, those patients initially diagnosed with SIRS or less than 10 to the fifth, who within a week developed a pneumonia with that same organism. Okay, now that's, that's a pretty, th that definition is pretty slanted against using bronchoscopy with BAL because a lot can happen in a week, and we didn't do organism typing or look at their genomes to see if, in fact, it was the same organism. But the chances are it was. So we thought if we're going to if we're going to be wrong on this, we need to we need to to be very careful about this because we didn't want to hurt any patients. So look, 232 patients again, typical urban trauma center. 60% of these were smokers. Uh, and our protocol was, again, if the patient met the clinical criteria, they underwent bronchoscopy with BAL with a gram stain of the effluent. And based on the gram stain, if they had gram positives, and, uh, vancomycin was added to their regimen. If they had less than 10 to the fifth organisms, their antibiotics were stopped. It didn't matter what their temperature was. It didn't matter what their white count was. It didn't matter anything. All that mattered was that they had less than 10 to the fifth organisms. And, it was, and the antibiotics were stopped. If they had greater than 10, 10 to the fifth or greater, their antibiotics were continued and streamlined according to uh, uh, sensitivities. It, it was amazingly consistent, uh, the 60-40 the ratio on how many people who clinically you think have pneumonia, who meet criteria for bronchoscopy with BAL, how many really don't? 60% of them really don't, only 40% of them do. And that, that number has remained relatively constant over the past 20 years. So one, one thing that we thought was the longer people were in the ICU, the more likely it was for their BAL to be positive. And so we looked at the number of, of bronchoscopies, uh, base, uh, uh, number of times a patient underwent bronchoscopy. Uh, so most, people, most patients just had one, about half as many had two, about half again had three, and a similar number uh, had greater than four. And then if you look at the percent with pneumonia, it's really kind of a flat line, which is interesting, which to to me says that each time a patient meets clinical criteria, it's just like the, it's the first time they've ever done it. So it, 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 you can't bank on someone who's been in the ICU for a long period of time that they're going to definitely develop pneumonia. Uh, the, the, the patients who developed pneumonia from those, compared to those who did not have pneumonia and the patients in the ICU, clinically, again, you can't really tell them apart. Uh, importantly, there was no difference in mortality or pneumonia-related mortality in these two groups. Uh, unfortunately, we did have some uh, uh, false negatives uh, that, that I'll get to in just a second. In fact, the only clinical difference was that there was an age, uh, a bit of an age difference relative to mortality. But other than that, that was it. So we looked at the 17 patients who had uh, a negative, uh, who had false negative BALs, and the only way you could figure those people out uh, is that they were hurt a little bit. Uh, more so than those that, that were, had a true negative BAL. I submit to you that even though there's a, st a statistical difference between an ISS of 36 and an ISS of 30, clinically you really can't tell those people apart. They're pretty banged up. So this false negative thing so really concerned us. So we tried to focus on that over the next couple of years. We added up, uh, we added uh, some more patients, got up to a little over 500 patients who, over the course of their hospital stay, had almost 1,400 bronchoscopies. Again, the typical uh, uh, makeup. So of these 1,400, 38% had pneumonia, 62% did not, 
Those that did had their antibiotics continued. Those that did not had their antibiotics stopped. Again, it's re remarkable, this whole 60-40 ratio. <clears throat> so what about this 10 to the 4th? You know, are we wrong with using 10 to the 5th instead of 10 to the 4th? We had 324 patients who had uh, 10 to the 4th organisms. Of those, a third of them had 10 to the 5th of something else. Okay, so they were then treated for their pneumonia. 60% of those just got better. We stopped their antibiotics, they went ahead and got better. And of that, we had a 9% false negative rate, which was similar to the prospective trial. Uh, so in these 38 patients of the 43 episodes, uh, the, the, the 9%, again, we're trying to figure out if we can tell clinically who's more likely to have a false negative diagnosis and clinically, again, even though there are some statistical differences just due to numbers, clinically it's very difficult to, to tell. But most importantly, there was no difference in mortality. Uh, so e even though the, the ICU stay and hospital stays and ventilator days were longer in those with, with false negatives, we didn't, other than the fact that they had to stay in the hospital longer, no one it w appeared to have been harmed by that. So from that, uh, we, we looked at sensitivity and specificities, again, based on 10 to the 5th, and found that 10 to the 4th, although pretty sensitive, we lose a fair amount of specificity uh, for these particular patients, since we know that 60% of them are going to get better anyway, and really only 9% are the ones that subsequently develop a pneumonia. So if you compare these two, uh, 10 to the 5th is... Uh, more specific, there's no mortality difference, but 10 to the 4th, will be, if you treat based on 10 to the 4th, that's going to be more expensive because you're going to be, wind up treating a significant number of patients with unnecessary antibiotics because they're going to get better anyway. So from that data, we concluded that, that uh, therapy for ventilator-associated pneumonia should be based on the results of the quantitative cultures. You can choose your diagnostic threshold. We feel very strongly that it should be 10 to the 5th. Uh, if you're nervous about it, then make it 10 to the 4th, but just know that you're going to, you're going to be um, selecting out some uh, patients who, who don't need antibiotic therapy. But what about empiric therapy? What do we do in the meantime? Because it takes a couple days for the quantitative cultures to come back. We'll just base that on, on the Gram stain. So th this is part of the data from the, from the prospective trial and, and looking at these five coefficients. And I went over this with the statistician. Statis you know, statistics to me are... It's the sort of thing where you're talking to the statistician, it makes perfect sense, you know, and you understand, you think, oh, yeah, I get that, right? And you walk out of the office, and, and not 40 seconds later, you think, now, wait a minute, that makes no sense. Well, what was that again? You know, so she got tired of me coming back to the office and said, wait, can you tell me this again? Because I keep, so these are five coefficients. You could hold a gun to my head. I could not tell you what these phi coefficients are, but she assured me uh, that these are accurate. And basically what this says is if you look at the gram stain and the correlation between the gram stain of the BAL effluent to whether or not that patient develops pneumonia with any of those particular organisms is no better than a coin toss. So you may as well just flip a coin if you're going to base anything on the gram stain of a bronchovial effluent. And if you think about it, it makes sense because the BAL effluent can grow a whole bunch of different things, but if they're not 10 to the 5th, we don't really care. So you're, you're going to have some gram positives and gram negatives in 10 to the 2, 10 to the 3rd that will probably show up on the gram stain, but are not clinically relevant. So why bother? So how do we treat these patients? Uh, this is just data showing the gram stain is horrible. So what we stumbled upon uh, uh, in this is that the pathogens change over time. Intuitively, it makes sense, and I would have guessed that on a multiple choice test, uh, but there, we, we didn't really know that. And, and so what we found, at least in trauma patients, is that in the first week, 70% of these pneumonias were due to gram, sensitive gram positives and haemophilus. Not particularly surprising, and only later in their hospital stay did they develop more of a gram negative, other than haemophilus, but develop more gram-negative pneumonias. Uh, so th here's, the, here's the gram-negative uh, bar. So uh, from that, we changed our empiric therapy uh, to this, this clinical pathway. If the patients have uh, clinical evidence of pneumonia, which is fever, leukocytosis, purulent sputum, or newer changing infiltrate on the chest x-ray, uh, 
if they have three or four of those things, then they undergo uh, bronchoscopy with BAL. And the empiric therapy is based on the number of days that they spent in the ICU. So if they're there during the first week, one to seven days, they get Ampsilbactam because that'll cover hemophilus and the sensitive gram positives that these patients typically will get. If they've been there greater than a, a week, then they get uh, third generation anti pseudomonal cephalosporin uh, plus vancomycin. And then if they have less than 10 to the fifth organisms, we still stop their antibiotics. If they have greater than 10 to the fifth, we adjust uh, if necessary. So from that, we concluded that empiric therapy really should be unit specific and based on the duration uh, of the ICU stay. What about those people that do develop pneumonia and they have, uh, you know, a particular gram negative that may be a, a, a bad actor, then that we should probably treat them for a longer period of time. Well, there's recommendations that have really uh, changed, and actually a, a group that was led by the, the two French guys that I told you about earlier really did a, a pretty nice study saying that you really didn't need prolonged therapy for uh, pseudomonas pneumonia in medical ICU patients. Uh, and that they're now pr uh, proponents uh, for limiting therapy, uh, especially uh, if their clinical signs uh, resolve. Note that these are based on the resolution of clinical signs and symptoms. But in trauma patients, we've already established that due to their inf that, that injury itself, since, it, since injury itself causes inflammation, that we can't really tell clinically whether someone is is has it resolved there in fact it, you know if they all get better and they're getting up eating a hamburger right that's one thing but not all those patients are like that uh, so it, clinically it's very difficult to tell whether their inflammatory response uh, has resolved or whether their pneumonia has going away and, and if you base it solely on clinical parameters uh, you can lead to prolonged therapy uh, which subsequently may uh, wind up leading to either relapse or development of, of, of resistant organisms. So what we did was we, de we, we developed a defined uh, bacteriologic strategy and that we base our therapy on the, uh, on the particular organism itself. Uh, and, and all this data is based on a study that we had done earlier where all patients had pneumonia Right? So when they're diagnosed with pneumonia, we do a repeat bronchoscopy on them at, at day seven. And then at day seven, we actually did them at day four and day seven and day 10 if they, if they uh, weren't better. And, and if those patients had a significant decrease in their colony count, so they went from 10 to the fifth to 10 to the third, so they had to drop two logarithms at minimum, but they had to drop below 10 to the fifth. Uh, and, and then we use that as our marker for ending antibiotic therapy. In, in a separate study that had zero correlation with CPIS, uh, but all that mattered was we followed the, the values of the quantitative culture. Uh, so that led to this particular algorithm. Again, if the patient has pneumonia, we repeat their BAL on day four, if they have less than 10 to the fifth, then it takes a couple of days for those cultures to come back. They get seven day course of antibiotics, poof, you're done. If not, they get a repeat BAL on about day seven ish. Uh, if they have dropped a 10 to the third, then they get 10 days of antibiotics. Uh, if not, then they get 14 days of antibiotics. So that's our algorithm now for the duration of therapy for these uh, patients. And if you look at, uh, again, can we tell them apart clinically? No, because they all continue to have uh, fevers. They all continue to have leukocytosis. Their PF ratios get a little better over time, but not, there's not really any difference between uh, 7, 10, and 14 days of therapy uh, in this particular population. So what we did was we looked at the, at the, the microbiologic resolution uh, of these patients based on the particular organism. And at seven days, a little over 20% of the patients who had MRSA had resolved down to the 10 to the third. But not very many Pseudomonas, Acinetobacter, Serratia, or Enterobacter, uh, they, they were all hovering uh, around 10% or so. 10 days, we got a whole bunch more of Acinetobacter, Serratia, and Enterobacter, not so much for MRSA and Pseudomonas, uh, but we found that 14 days of therapy were really necessary for MRSA and Pseudomonas um, 
a smattering uh, in, in, in the other three organisms. So then that, 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 that led to the following uh, algorithm. We're big on algorithms in Memphis. I don't know if you could tell that or not. Uh, so if a patient has MRSA or Pseudomonas, they don't get a they don't get a follow-up bronchoscopy or a pro, we call it a protocol bronch. Uh, they get antibiotics for 14 days and you're done with it. If they have if they have an early pneumonia, right within the first seven days with Haemophilus, they get seven days and that's it. Uh, if they have Acinetobacter serratia or Enterobacter, really any of the other Gram negatives, those patients undergo repeat bronchoscopy on day seven. If they have 10 to the third, they get 10 days. If there's not quite 10 to the third yet, then they get 14 days of antibiotics. And th does that system work? And I'll show you this. This, this is we compared really over two different time points uh, the, 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 sensi the, the organisms and the sensitivities that were grown over these two separate time periods. And really what this shows is despite these things being about between 10 and 15 years apart, the overall incidence is relatively unchanged. Okay, so the incidence of gram positives really hasn't changed. MRSA has gone up a little bit, but that, in part, that's because uh, in, the, in our community, MRSA has increased dramatically just uh, you know, out on the street. Uh, for gram negatives, again, if you look at 20% you know, versus 18%, uh, uh, over time. So really, there, there's no difference in the antibiotic or in the organisms that are grown. Well, what about the susceptibilities? If we compare the two particularly bad actors, Pseudomonas and Acinetobacter, it, during this time period, the sensitivities didn't change, right? So from that, that tells us that this particular algorithm, this particular method, basing the therapy solely on the BAL, is actually very effective uh, and, and doesn't select out resistant organisms. So because of that, we determined that you can base the, the, the duration of therapy simply on the organism itself. Uh, so what about then other service-related antibiotics uh, and, and impact on drug resistance? If you ask them, they'll say, well, they're not on antibiotics for that long, so it doesn't really matter. Well, we looked at uh, almost 700 episodes of, of uh, pneumonia, identified those that were multi-drug resistant, looked at acinetobacter and pseudomonas, looked at those that were sensitive and multi-drug resistant. And as you would expect, the, the predictors for multi-drug resistance uh, uh, were prophylactic antibiotic days and inappropriate initial antibiotic therapy. Okay, so these were people that just happened to fall out of, of the algorithm, so we missed a day or, or, or so of that. Uh, but more worrisome is the increased number of prophylactic antibiotic days. This, uh, this then prompted a, a sit-down meeting with our orthopedic colleagues, who then we all came up with, a, oddly enough, an algorithm on how to manage patients with open fractures which included the duration of therapy for patients with open fractures, which was decreased dramatically uh, over time, and again, with, with uh, no apparent difference in outcome uh, for these patients. So from that, we concluded that prolonged antibiotic, or prolonged empiric therapy is indeed associated with multidrug resistant organisms. So let me just summarize, in, in trauma patients, ventilator-associated pneumonia uh, is uh, associated with mortality, it's the diagnosis is best made by quantitative cultures, and whether you choose to use quantitative BAL or quantitative brush, uh, it's uh, the dealer's choice, but quantitative cultures are the way to do it. The empiric therapy should be based on the duration in the ICU, and that should be ICU-specific. ICU you know, the, the organisms in, in our ICU at the Elvis Presley Memorial Trauma Center may be very different from the organisms uh, that, that you all have here. So... You've got to base it strictly on those in the ICU. It is safe and cost-effective to base the therapy on the organism and uh, to avoid unnecessary, uh, prolonged unnecessary antibiotics. Uh, you can avoid them as long as you want to, you know, if, if your goal is to reduce multidrug resistance. So I'll leave you with our final diagnostic. This, after this years of multiple studies, this is the final diagnostic algorithm for BAL. If the patient, er, for, for pneumonia, if the patients have clinical evidence of pneumonia with fever, leukocytosis, purulent sputum, or newer changing infiltrate on the chest x-ray, 
If they have three of the four of those, they undergo bronchoscopy with BAL, empiric therapy is instituted based on their stay in the ICU, less than seven days, Ampsolbactam, greater than seven days, cefepime and vancomycin. Again, if they have less than 10 to the fifth organisms, their antibiotics are stopped. If they have 10 to the fifth organisms or more, then their antibiotics are continued. This is what we use. We continue to use this to this day, uh, and it, it seems to work. I'll leave you with this final thought. I couldn't really sum it up any better than Stevie Wonder. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, th here's, that's, that's it. That's the Elvis Preston Memorial Trauma Center, the only freestanding building in the world named in honor of the king. Thank you very much for this incredible honor. I'll be happy to answer your questions. visiting us in honor of Felix and a great presentation about a really important topic that, as you say, may not be always the most glamorous, but without a doubt, it affects all the patients we take care of. So thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you so much. We probably have a few minutes for some questions. Dr. Medina. So that was a great presentation. It was thank you. something we all struggle with all the time. The one thing that I'm missing is what about qualitative, not quantitative assessment? Because there are pure and sputums, and then there are some pure and sputums. And there are x-rays that have some input rate, and then there are x-rays that really have some input rate. And I would have a hard I love algorithms, because I don't have much of a brain of my own. But I would have a hard time stopping antibiotics on some of these patients based on a culture quantitative result, when qualitatively, I see well, as I'm sure you've noticed, we're pretty aggressive with bronchoscopy. In fact, you know, presence of airway is an indication for bronchoscopy, uh, just about. So for those patients who have continuous secretions, right, so they've probably got some sort of bronchitis or they're annoyed by the endotracheal tube or whatever it happens to be. Those, if they have negative cultures, we stop their antibiotics, period, right? If they have a negative BAL. But we, they may be on the daily bronch list just for toilet. Uh, and, and so we're pretty aggressive uh, w with that. Uh, the residents are actually, if there's any fourth year medical students here, it's a great rotation for a fourth year medical student because you'll do more bronchoscopies than you can shake a stick at. Uh, that, and that, that's, but that's how we would manage that particular those patients. Um, first is you, you chose a, a cost study early on in your experience, but it looks like the algorithm has gotten much more complicated, including empiric antibiotics because cultures are back in multiple bronchs. And I want, so I'm wondering if you had the opportunity to revisit the, the cost analysis. And then my second question was so many bronchs that you do, I wonder if you could make a, a comment about the safety of the bronchs if there is. Okay, uh, the, the first thing, we have not repeated the, the, uh, uh, the cost study. I think that, yeah, we do a lot of, uh, we, we do a lot of Bronx, but as part of, of creating the final algorithm, you know, all those are part of a protocol. So, so you know, we, we couldn't charge the patient for those anyway. Um, don't tell the hospital that. Uh, no, I'm kidding. Uh, but so now that now that we've come up with all these things, I think the cost analysis will probably be not quite as dramatic, but but there will still be a difference, and again, primarily in saving the antibiotic cost. Second thing, as far as the the complications of bronchoscopy and the safety of bronchoscopy, uh, given the numbers that we've had and, and the experience that we've had, uh, we've uh, you'll have the occasional patient that will drop their Sats. You know, and then you stop the bronchos you stop the bronchoscopy. Uh, the occasional patient who will have uh, uh, int you know increasing intracranial pressures, then you stop the bronchoscopy. Uh, you just have to be able to to um, yeah. There, there's a fair amount of clinical judgment that goes into this. I off the top of my head, I cannot think of a pneumothorax that we've had, but we probably have. Um, other than that, it, it's it, it's. Um, It, it works pretty well. Dr. Utter and Dr. Great body of work. Um, and I, I, I think I know the answers you're going to give me, but I do have two questions for you. So one on 
bronchoscopy. Obviously, you need to start the antibiotics before you do the bronch. So there's a time sensitivity to it. Do you stack these 24-7? Um, and, and should all centers try to do that? And the second, second question is, um, as I'm sure you're aware, there's been a few randomized trials on this topic of centers that use uh, invasive diagnosis and those who don't. Um, that hasn't shown a benefit. So what do you make of that? Well, I just think they're full of malarkey. No, <laughs> I would tell you what I really thought they were full of, but mixed company. Uh, uh, it, it, to, in answer your, to your, answer your first question, there's, there are no clocks in the TICU, right? So if somebody meets the criteria, you know, we're there, uh, we're in-house, uh, well, not me anymore, but but we're in-house uh, now, and, and the residents, you know, they, they just, you know, we just go at it, so it doesn't really matter. And interesting, though, because that makes the, and that, that changes the time of the reads, right? Because micro reads all the, 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 the cultures at 10 a.m. So if you send them a specimen, you know, you do it at 5 o'clock in the morning, then the first, th th that first day will, will always read no growth, right? Because it's only been five hours. Uh, so it, it it changes how long it takes to get the final results back, but nonetheless, yes, we do them 24/7. Um, as far as as uh, not showing any difference, it's kind of hard to show an overall outcome difference. I think uh, whether you use invasive or non-invasive, but I think if you if and it's very difficult to do in these in uh, in these um, meta-analyses because you can't really tease out the patients, but at least based on our single institution experience, it's very difficult for me to believe that those that use prolonged antibiotic therapy don't have a higher incidence of multidrug resistant organisms. I, I just, I, I, if somebody, I, I just, I find that incredibly hard to believe. Uh, so I think if you look at something from, from that perspective, uh, then I think that, that that's where something like bronchoscopy will in fact show a difference. Dr. White, fantastic talk in the little Irish. Um, one thing I noticed from, from your talk is that you know, we seem to get bamboozled a little bit by biomarkers, and you're talking about the simplicity of what count. Is there any role that you found in the use of looking at CRPs or, or procalcitonins in, in the progress yeah. of, at any point? That, that's, it, that's a great question because it's, you know, that's part of the whole magic bullet thing. Gee, if we could just send this one test, then that's going to really tell us. Uh, we have looked at procalcitonin uh, very briefly, not, not really enough, at least preliminary data says it doesn't really impact anything. Uh, C-reactive protein, we actually looked at, our pharmacy colleagues were convinced that C-reactive protein was, a, was the answer, and it's not. Uh, it doesn't, it, it's one of those things that sounds like a great idea, but again, since those are markers primarily of inflammation, we know that, right? We know they have inflammation, so they're 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 not very discriminating. At least in our hands, maybe 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 they are in others, but not in ours. Well, this is really great, provocative, raised lots of important questions on a problem that we all deal with every day that we haven't completely solved. So, thank you for your contribution. Thank you. Thank you.